Um, so one of the questions that I that was brought up in our research by our researcher Serge Massis that I was really interested in asking you around NLP was that you have pointed out how practitioners, including myself, tend to use pre-made lists of stop words before they start doing NLP analysis. So um, maybe quickly give us a, your definition of stop words and then tell us why you, I should stop using a pre-made list. So stop words are, um, are, are lists of words that people are like, oh, those are not important. I can take them out. And so they are words like um, the and of. And so uh, in English, a conservative stop word list would be on the order of like 100 and a more aggressive stop word list would be on the order of like 1,000. And the way that these lists were made is that they're they're old they're old these lists come from like the mid 20th century typically and they were made by taking huge for the time huge corpuses of language and counting up words looking at the top thousand and deciding where a cutoff should be and then deciding uh, like you a person a person decided where to make the cutoff and a person decided um wh- are there words that I should or should not um keep in um there are uh there are so many problems with stop words so a some of them literally have typos in them you know and if you you're like well is that good or bad if someone had a typo for you know I don't know. I can't think of a long enough word. To, but let's say that someone had a typo, like A D N. Like maybe I do want to take that out. But but it's strange, right? That there are actually there are some words that have typos in there. Another thing that happens is that because these were created from list from from corpuses of language, like many books that were put together you actually end up with evidence of um, gender bias just in the stop word list. Like, because, uh, like, let's say we take a whole huge n- a number of books, um, there are more uses of those, but in those books of he than she. There are more uses in those books of his than her. And some of those stop word lists actually have, for some of those sets of, you make a list of all the English pronouns. They have all of them for masculine and they only have like three quarters of them <laughs> for the feminine version because of where the cutoff was, right? So you, you're you like, oh man, these are, even though you're like, whoa, this is like the simplest thing you can do, make a list of words. They are, they are, all of our like challenges around data analysis, data science, data sources, they show up even in this like dead simplest thing you can do. So I, I avoid now, I now avoid using lists of stop words when I do topic models because, um, uh, they will always end up being like the most, um, the most, uh, probable words, but like we just talked about, the most probable words are never very interesting. You need to look at these other, these other kind of um, statistics, give you a better sense of what topics are really about. When I do supervised um, machine learning, I often leave them in as well because it turns out it's actually informative. The way some do- the documents use even those boring words, it can be predictive. Like they can actually have predictive information. Like if you're doing classification, how it uses those boring words can help. If I'm doing EDA, I sometimes take them out. If I'm like trying to show the top, like most common words and I just am like, well, let me take out like those boring ones. I do sometimes still take them out there, but I often will supplement it with um, even EDA approaches that provide uh, a ways for seeing differences across groups that do not depend on taking out those stop words. So some examples of that are looking for log odds of words, like what are the highest log odds words. I have a package for this that's called tidy low for tidy log odds. Or um, And that's actually an interesting approach anytime you're looking at differences of counts across groups. It doesn't have to be language, but it's, it's um, applying it to language is really great. Um, I still use things like TFIDF as an exploratory tool, uh, which I bet many people have heard of. And um, I've written about like what it means and people can dig into that more. So so that's my pitch. That's my pitch. My pitch is um, they suffer from the same problems that almost any data science process suffers from, even though they are so simple. And if you're doing unsupervised learning machine or supervised machine learning, you probably want those words. And if you're doing EDA, there are alternative approaches that give you better answers. Very cool answer. Something that I have been teaching for years, something that I was aware of that is an issue in stop list is that 
for some particular application you might have, you at least need to be looking through the list of stop words. Like you, you shouldn't just be using it without, I mean, you've made a good argument to not be using them at all. But something at least um, that I have been saying for years is that you need to know what the stop words are in there. So for example, if you're doing sentiment analysis yes. and one of your stop words is not, you're going to yes. be pulling out the word not. <laughs> so yes. how are you going to, like, that's, that's like one of the most critical words in figuring out the sentiment of, of a document. Totally, totally. My uh, my first book that I wrote with Dave has an example of this. It's back to Jane Austen. So it turns out one of the most commonly were used stop words has the word miss on um, the stop word list. Or no, I'm sorry. This is sentiment analysis. Sorry. So miss is on in the sentiment analysis list as a negative word. So this is slightly different. It's not a stop mm. word list, but a sentiment mm -hmm. lexicon list. Mm -hmm. But they're the very similar um uh, con constraints at play. So miss is on the word as a, is on the list as a negative word. Like I miss you or you miss that. Uh, I don't know. You miss quarterly earnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. It was, it's on the list as a negative word. So if you look at Jane Austen novels and you like do sentiment analysis using one of these lexicons, it shows up. It's like, Oh, the word that is driving negative sentiment, like, in a top 10 way, like a lot is the word miss. But of course, in Jane Austen's work, like works, everyone, that's how everyone is referred to. It's all like Miss Bennett, you know, like, 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 like everyone is miss, everyone is miss. So they're not, they're not, um, they're not negative at all. Like those are, those are neutral words. So that's a, that's a, a way that the, that applies to sentiment analysis. And, and actually the more sophisticated tools, sentiment analysis tools now, which they do better, but they are actually not uh, immune from this problem because it's just basically fancier counting and fancier linear algebra. Like they do a little, they do better, but they are not immune from this exact problem that words in their training data were used a certain way. And if it's used in a different way, it's like mismatch between your training data and the data you're using it on. And that's one of the real downsides of using the pre-trained models is that either they're too general or use a different way, or, you know, there's, there's, it's uh, similar problems. Awesome. Great, uh, insightful answer there. We got a ton from you. My stop word question has now been answered and I will stop using them. <laughs> <laughs> you made a clear case. Uh, you know, built-in gender bias, these kinds of just kind of weird statistical phenomena around where exactly the cutoff was, yep. what data they were trained on.